Praise the Lord, this is Anthony A. Walker. Thank you for stopping by this channel. Today I want to talk about five ways to receive spiritual gifts. Now, spiritual gifts, I mean, so many people ask questions about them. They want to know, what is my spiritual gift? How do I get the spiritual gifts? Uh, how do I operate in spiritual gifts? And I want to establish some of these things today, but in particular, how to receive the spiritual gifts. And I believe this will be very insightful for you today. So first of all, we need to establish the context of what exactly do I mean when I'm talking about spiritual gifts and what do other people mean when they're talking about spiritual gifts? Because not everybody really uses the same definition per se. The most common understanding, I would say, especially in uh, spirit-filled congregations, is the gifts of the Spirit most often refer to those nine gifts found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I would say, for the most part, I'm speaking about that today. However, there are some other giftedness or gifts that are represented and, and spoken about in Romans chapter 12, and then the administration gifts, so-called, in Ephesians chapter 4. So we'll briefly cover those, what they are, but we're going to have a main focus as far as the spiritual gifts found in 1 Corinthians 12, which are the charismata, the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. So first, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to be reading beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now here is where we get into the list. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different or diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So these are the gifts I'm referring to today. Each one of them does deserve to be explained as far as what it is. I'm not going to get too much into that. That will probably be a separate video for a separate time for what exactly these gifts are. But I just want to talk about how to receive these spiritual gifts. This brings me to point one. The very first way to receive spiritual gifts is actually to ask let me go to the Bible and show you. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, Jesus says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Long story short, asking for spiritual gifts is not wrong. You can ask and receive standing on this very passage. Now, Luke also records this very account and he switches it up a little bit. Well, let me read that account too. Luke 11, beginning in verse nine. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? 
Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, notice the context, he's talking about giving good gifts, to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So here Luke is trying to identify a gift, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we know that it's through the Holy Spirit that the other gifts of the Holy Spirit are manifested. So we can relate these to each other. And we see here that if we ask for spiritual gifts, God in fact can grant us these things. And I believe he's more willing than we think he is to grant the gifts of the Spirit to those that ask and are persistent. That is the key, being persistent. The second way in which you can receive the spiritual gifts or gifts of the spirit is actually through desire. So it's similar to asking because typically we ask for things we desire, but this is a unique characteristic that I'm going to bring in here. Now I'll show you a great example of this. First Corinthians chapter number 12, we'll start there. And we were just here, so we know that this is in the context of the gifts of the Spirit, which is key because a lot of people get messed up by taking things out of context. But the context here is, in fact, the gifts of the Spirit. So after he talks about the gifts of the Spirit and how the body of Christ is one and we have different members, but we're all one body, he has this interesting set of statements at the end. And beginning in verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, this is a very important thing because right here it says we should, in fact, be desiring the gifts of the spirit. And here it says the best gifts. So the next logical question is what are the best gifts? Gifts, And I think from 1 Corinthians 14, we can glean what some of the best gifts are, if not the best gift. And let's go there right now, because this is also where it talks about desire. If we go to chapter 14 and beginning in verse 1, Paul says this, Pursue love, which he talks all about in chapter 13, and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So because Paul is saying, especially this gift, we know that that is one of the best gifts that he's referring to in the context of 1 Corinthians 12. So he's saying prophecy, to prophesy, is one of the best gifts. He talks more about that. Verse 2, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke it with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets. That is, if this person who speaks in tongues, which is a message to the congregation in this context, not necessarily individual prayer language, as it's so called, um, but this is in the context of just praying, uh, giving a message in tongues. And that is a whole nother discussion. But there are two differences as far as speaking in tongues as a what we call prayer language so often or the this particular thing, the gift of diverse tongues or the giving a message in tongues to the congregation to be interpreted. OK, so for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. 
This is powerful. So now we know that one of those best gifts Paul is talking about is in fact the gift of prophesy, uh, prophecy. Now here's why it's so beneficial. He gives an example in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and just going down to, we'll start in verse 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Now, here's where it's key right here. 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. When you prophesy and you reveal the secrets of somebody's heart that you had no way of knowing, especially in regards to a complete stranger, but you know very specific details through what we typically call word of knowledge, but it's under the branch of prophesying. So you prophesy and you tell them the secrets of their heart, things that they might have told not even another soul, even their closest family member or friend, but you were able to tell them specific detailed things about that, the, you know, this uh, an event or a situation or thoughts or things in their life, it says right here, they will become convinced because they'll know that there's no way you could have known that unless God told you. And so Paul is saying, this is why it's powerful, because then they will fall on their face and worship God and say, God is truly among you. This is why I always recommend people contend for the gift of prophecy. Ask God to prophesy, because this is in fact what Paul says to do. It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. That's powerful. So desire is the second way to receive spiritual gifts. Number three, God's will. Simply God's will. Sometimes it's just the will of God that you should operate in a certain gift. And this does not negate the previous point that you can ask God for gifts or desire other gifts that you may not have. But I believe everybody Based upon what we're about to read, everybody has some gift of the Spirit, but you can always ask and pray for more and desire more based upon the previous two points. Let me read. And we already read it, but I think we need to read it in light of this. God's will. After he lists all of the gifts of the Spirit, or these nine gifts in, of the Spirit in particular in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verses uh, four, well, verses seven through uh, 10, we get to verse 11. It says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So God's will does have a lot to say with what spiritual gifts you have. However, we also have clearance, if you will, in the word to desire other spiritual gifts that we do not presently have. But remember, God's will is something that he can choose to do whatever he wants in your life. So a lot of people, and arguably here it says, and we'll go to verse seven, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So everybody, each person in the body of Christ has some spiritual gift that is about to be listed, you know, and so you you might be operating in the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, maybe working of miracles or diverse tongues or interpretation of tongues. You might not know your spiritual gift. And again, this deserves a whole nother video, how to identify your spiritual gifts. But I just want to help you to understand that there are ways in which you can position yourself and posture yourself to be recipients of the spiritual gifts. I'm going to give you another example of God's will being at work in receiving the gifts of the Spirit. If we go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number two, I love this passage. It's very powerful. Hebrews chapter number two, I'm going to start with verse number 
2. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So again, he distributes these things, miracles, signs, wonders, gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. This is powerful because God's will can simply be, I want you to operate in the gift of the working of miracles. So I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to ask. You don't have to desire. It's simply my will that you operate in this particular gift. Or I'm going to give you the gift of the interpretation of tongues so that when somebody gives a message in tongues to the congregation, you will interpret it because that is my will. So God's will is the third way in which you can receive spiritual gifts. And remember, everybody already has a gift. So you have a gift because it says he give, he's given gifts to every man, the manifestation to every man, every person. So you have to find your gift of the spirit. But I would ask God for revelation on what that gift is. And I think another video is due here for how to know what your spiritual gifts are, because there are ways and indications uh, in which you can find out what gifts of the spirit you may or may not have at the moment. Again, but you can desire and ask for more. There is no um, limitation in the scripture either that you can only operate in one gift or you can only have two gifts or three is the max. That's for the super spiritual folk. No, it's not about your deep spirituality. It's about do you have the gift or not? And I believe that people can operate in all nine gifts of the spirit. Some you might operate in stronger than others or at one point in life. And it might just be distributed according to God's will for the moment. But the other thing is Romans chapter 11. It tells us that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So he's not going to give a gift and then take the gift. And I have another video. Um, if you just click the link that pops up there in the top there is another video that I deal with this particular subject is can God or does God take away your spiritual gifts? I recommend watching that because it's going to give you a lot of understanding and insight and will save you a lot of trouble. Praise God. Number four, the fourth point. And these last two points are very interesting. It takes a little bit of dissecting the scripture a little bit more uh, in depth to understand these next points. The fourth point is Humility, which leads to grace or humility for short. OK, we know that the grace of God is what causes the gifts to come. That is one of the main things to know. You don't earn a gift of the spirit. And again, this is in my other video where I talk about do does God take away spiritual gifts? I talk about this more in detail, but humility is key here. Humility is one way to receive the spiritual gifts. And I'm going to show it here. If we go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. And this, again, is one of the passages where it does talk about these other gifts, which are spiritual in nature, but they're not the nine gifts of the spirit, though there is an overlap where it talks about the gift of prophecy. But it says this, Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now pay attention to this, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace of that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, but uh, uh, he who gives with liberality, who, who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So you have this other section where it talks about gifts with the overlap of the gift of prophecy. But there are other things that it talks about too: ministering, teaching, exhortation, etc. But the point you need to get from this right now in this context is regards to humility leading to grace is 
verse number six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So it's actually the different levels of grace. So more grace, therefore, means more gifts or certain graces or the grace of God in your life can lead to gifts. So we know that gifts come through grace. So here is where there's revelation now. How do we receive more of the grace of God working so that gifts of the spirit can be more active in our life? Because if it's only based upon grace, how do we position ourselves to be recipients of more grace? Again, you're not earning anything because that's what grace is in to begin with. It's not nothing you earned. It is grace, but you can posture yourself to be recipients or allow the grace of God that's already in you to be more manifest. And I'm going to show you how. The Bible says, and this is in found in Proverbs. It's found in, uh, it's quoted in 1 Peter 5:5 5, 5, and quoted in James chapter 4 verse 6. And I'm going to read the passage in 1 Peter just since we are in the New Testament right now for our reading and for the gifts of the spirit. This is what the Bible says, 1 Peter 5 beginning in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For, here's the key, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So there you have it. Humility leads to God granting grace. So that is the posture we need. And if we have gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, then we want more grace given to us. And here it says God gives grace to the humble. Now, then the next thing is how can we be humble? And I'm going to give you a key. And this is something you can make use of and make the connection now. The Bible says this in the book of Psalm chapter 35. This is very, very powerful. David, he says something that is so profound and relates to this and brings out the revelation. Psalm 35 and verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. And here's the key. I humbled myself with fasting. And we can put a full stop there. I know the, the verse goes on and my prayer would return to my own heart. But I humbled myself with fasting. This is a profound statement. I humbled myself with fasting. So think about it. Why do you think that fasting is so used throughout the Bible? You see the prophets fasting. You have Moses, you have Elijah, you have uh, Ezra, you have all these different fasts. You have Esther incorporating fasting. Why? It's a sign of humility. And when you humble yourself, God's grace is attracted to this. And based upon what we read in Romans, that we have gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, well, we need to have more of the grace of God through humility, and then there will be more of the manifestation of spiritual gifts. This is why humility is key. When you fast, it breaks you down and it makes you humble. The more you fast, the better, I'd say. And when you pray, and you really get yourself out of the way and you're praying and spending time with God, you are saying, in essence, I can't do this without you, God. I humble myself before you. This is key. And that is why often fasting and prayer leads to spiritual gifts and the supernatural. You have heard all the stories about it, I'm sure, and you may have experienced it in your own life, but when you pray and fast, it does something. And I noticed in my life when I am fasted up and when I'm prayed up and I stay in a posture and position of prayer and I'm intentional in fasting and prayer that the gifts I already have begin to work and they work uh, 
like clockwork, if you will. They're just so immediate and so strong and smooth. But when you are so overcome by flesh and you've just been eaten and all this stuff, you're not going to be as sensitive to the spirit. You're just not because your flesh has this tendency to block out the free flowing of the spirit of God. Amen. So point number four, the fourth way to receive spiritual gifts is humility, which leads to grace, which leads to more of the gifts of the spirit. And the final way to receive spiritual gifts. Point number five is proximity. Proximity. Now, this is going to be a little bit interesting for a lot of people. Proximity. What do I mean? Well, first, we're going to go back to the laws of reproduction in Genesis chapter one, and we're going to pull a spiritual understanding and truth from this. This is what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse number 11. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit, according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. Now you might ask me, what in the world does that have to do with spiritual gifts? Well, it has to do with a spiritual principle. Now, in here, this particular context is a natural principle, but there's a spiritual principle, which is the law of reproduction. Things reproduce after their own kind and their seed is within itself. So what does that mean? It means that when you get around certain gifts, they have a tendency to start being an operation in your life. Not always, but this is a great way because that seed, the seed of that gift is in itself and it reproduces after its own kind. For instance, a giraffe doesn't have an elephant baby. That's not its own kind. It reproduces other giraffes. So gifts of tongue can reproduce other gifts of tongues in people's life. Gift of prophecy can reproduce the gift of prophecy in other people's lives if you're around it and you have exposure, proximity. And I'm going to prove it with the Bible. And I know this from real experience of seeing people after I've operated in gifts of the spirit at different places, uh, you'll see people start operating in those gifts just because it happens. And some people say gifts of the spirit are rather caught than taught. Because you can know all about the gifts of the Spirit and never operate in them. But for some reason, however it operates and however they work, oftentimes these gifts seem to be caught rather than taught. Okay, so your first Samuel 19, beginning in verse 18. This is when David is fleeing from Saul. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Now it was told Saul saying, take note, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the spirit of God, this is the spirit of God. It's not a familiar spirit. This is the real spirit of God, mind you. The Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at Naoth in Ramah. So he went there to Naoth in Ramah. Then the spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. This is powerful. Saul is trying to capture David. He's trying to find him, capture him, and put an end to him. He sends his messengers. They come to the place where Samuel, no doubt, had his school of the prophets. And all of a sudden, the spirit of prophecy is so strong there that these messengers catch the spirit of God, if you will, the gift of prophecy. And they start prophesying. It happens three times, and then it happens once more when Saul comes. It was such a strong spirit of prophecy where Samuel was in that particular place that the gift of prophecy fell upon them. This is what I could call 
proximity, receiving gifts by proximity. So if you know people that are really uh, deeply operating in certain gifts and you desire those gifts, you can incorporate any number of these above principles that I've given you today and begin to see those gifts very likely manifest in your life. God wants us to operate in his gifts. He didn't leave us to evangelize and minister with just words, but with power. And this is part of the power. These are tools God has given to his body and we need to use them more than ever. It's a way that we can effectively minister to each other in the body and to minister to the world that's in need. We have to use God's spiritual gifts. He's given them to us and the Bible says we should desire spiritual gifts. Well, thank you for listening. God bless you. Until next time. Peace.